Hello and welcome to Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin and this is the show where you can have your property related questions answered by our team of property experts. And joining me today is John Reynolds, property developer and CEO of Titan Developments Limited. Welcome, John. Thanks, Steve. Trust Mrs. Reynolds is well today. This is a big hello to you, Steve. Big fan. Jolly good. Well, at least we've got one view. <laughs> right. Thank you, John. And joining John today is Andrew Binstock for the first time on Property Question Time. Andrew is auctioneer, partner and co-founder of Auction House London. Welcome to you. Thank you for having me. Good. OK, well, nice to see you both and we'll get straight on with the questioning. And uh, John, you're going first. Assuming that current thinking on interest rates is correct, i.e. An, an imminent reduction, do the panel think that this will be enough to maintain the increase in activity of house builders and therefore go some way to solving the housing shortages nationwide? Mm, interesting question. Mm. Uh, in, in, in answer to the question, I do think it will, but it's not the solution, clearly. Um, it will keep and help stimulate you know, people that are looking to potentially move but are stalling because they don't think they can afford it. Developers that potentially are mothballing or delaying taking forward a planning consent or even submitting a planning consent because actually, do I want to build it out in this current climate? Mm. Um, I think British in particular are pretty good at procrastinating or, or worrying. And if there's any uncertainty, which we've had so much, and that's the political side of things um, over the last few years as well, then actually it's almost better to just stay put. But we have a shortage of housing. You know, there are people that are going to be downsizing or growing as a family or their change of circumstances mean that they want to move. Um, and if they're delaying because of interest rates, specifically because it's affordability, then it will only help. But it's definitely not the solution. You know, we have a far bigger conversation about what will stimulate. Well, I, I've always held, John, as you know, because we've talked about it before, that um, <clears throat> I, I think that if developers know that they can sell their product, then they'll build as many homes as you need and, and the shortages would be over in an instant. There shouldn't be a shortage of no. housing. But I mean, with today, even today's slightly more relaxed mortgage conditions, it's still huge deposits that are needed. And, and this is really just the, the, the cap on the sales, isn't yeah. it? I think, I think the key thing with right now is the fact that it's the highest it's been in so many years. And in the previous conversation, I remember when I said interest rates are high and you said, are they? Because you can think back to times when they're not, but they're the highest they've been on affordability for people in living memory, if you like. And for a lot of people that are coming new to the market. So I think that confidence element that, okay, we're coming out of a peak. We're coming into a place where, okay, if that's the first drop, will there be another one at the end of the year? Does that mean that I can start making moves now and that will, that will start a wave of movement, which is what we need. But I listened to one of the economists the other day uh, uh, saying, you know, if people are sitting there thinking this is going to go back down to one or half a percent, those yeah. days have gone. It's okay. over. There's a moment in time. Yeah. Oh, you know, we might we might in a year's time be a percent less or yeah. a percent and a quarter less. But I think that's about about the end of it. I mean, interesting point that you raised there, um, John, about people mothballing things. I mean, here in London, we've got quite a few developers that have... Um, said, no, I'm just going to leave the development as it is unfinished for a couple of years till market conditions change, or hopefully so. And I've got other friends that are sort of going around the country picking up developments that are half finished at quite advantageous prices in the hope of finishing them. And I do wonder, uh, um, Andrew, just to bring you in on this, um, are, are the auction houses seeing developments coming into auction that are partly built and looking for people to finish them? Not, not regularly. Um, we have seen a huge influx in the amount of what I would call development sites coming to auction, mm. hope value, um, plots, things that might have some sort of future potential for development. Um, again, but when I talk to our developer clients, the costs are so high now. And obviously they, they have to factor in resale prices, profits and all this sort of thing. Um, again, I'm, I think a lot of people are buying, uh, are buying these sites with a view to doing the developments at some point in the long term future rather than right now. Um, but yeah, I, I have seen in terms of lot numbers of that sort of um, type of auction lot, hugely, huge growth in, in land plots and people trying to cash in on spare bits of grass around their developments and things like that. I mean, I know here, you know, a lot, a lot of these developments around here are 60, 70 storeys and possibly gross development value of perhaps even three quarters of a billion pounds, perhaps. 
Well, you get halfway and your material's mm. sort of double in cost. I mean, you can't just That's stop, awful. can you? As a developer, you're committed from the outset. You've got a gross development value. And of course, that gross development will probably come down from when you set out based on interest rate increases and political uncertainty and costs have increased. So the reason to do it has got a lot smaller. And so I think I know of a few developments where they just they just stopped midway through. You know, and actually, what's going to happen there? You know, can they afford to keep paying interest on what's already probably a sizable amount of drawdown? Yeah. I think one thing that's saving a number of developers in that context is the, the kind of the, the, the large landlord, the PRS buyer that's coming in and taking, which never makes the auction, never makes the, the estate agent's showroom, if you like. Mm. Um, but that's not necessarily helping the housing shortage. You know, that helps the rental side of things. So it's, 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 there's a lot more that needs to be done. To you, you get the odd individual who has started to renovate something and then obviously runs out of money, goes of bankrupt, whatever it is, and that might find its way into auction. But exactly. It's, it's a rare auction lot, that one. We've had many questions in over the last few months as to whether um, lenders are sympathetic about material costs sort of, you know, going up 20, 30, even 40 percent sometimes within yeah. months. Yeah. Um, and the answer is they're not. <laughs> no, no. Um, no, it's a tough gig. Yeah. Which, is, which is why a lot of develop, developers are not taking on new projects, which is why we've got this, this slump right now. Yeah. I think it's the lowest uh, you know, kind of activity we've had in, in years. I really don't see what the government can do about very much, really. No, and I, I think a lot of, a lot of blames are portioned with the government, and rightly so, for a lot of poor decisions and, and kind of that sort of thing. But I think, we just, I think you know, planning and strategy is a key thing. Government could spend a lot more time. I mean, it's, it's something we talked about before. How many ma housing ministers have we had in the last 10 years? And there's no consistency. So you get that right. You put a focus in place that, that developers can work towards. Um, and then actually, if there was any incentives or any, any kind of way of supporting developers in that, that, that would all fall into that. There's nothing. No. You're just left to your own device. That is a great point about planning, funnily enough. The amount of stock that we see that comes into auction that has had failed planning, mm. and now the seller is, is in that kind of what do I do now situation. And then obviously we have the obligation to disclose whatever. And so you find that problem coming in. And then the next buyer is thinking, well, I've now got to find an alternative scheme to the one that this chap failed with. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a sort of snowball effect. Yeah. It's not great. And that takes time. Time yeah. is money. So that's and a lot of expertise way. as well. Yeah. You know, someone's got to come up with a completely different scheme that is, you know, going to appease the planners where the first one failed. But what if that was headed off at the outset with some a framework that didn't make it so complicated? And right. you know what, that should determine you get forty units from that, exactly. six units from that. You know what you're going to do. Speed the time frames up. There's your. That'd, that'd be a great idea. That's yeah. exactly what should happen. Okay. Good. Well, we should need to move on. Andrew, your first question. Um, I have a portfolio of Vitalet properties, yeah. which I've decided to liquidate. The properties are spread across the UK. The, f um, the fastest way of disposal would appear to be selling by auction. However, I wonder if I should place them individually with local auction houses relevant to the location or present them as a single collective lot in perhaps a London-based auction where investment interest is possibly highest. Um, okay, interesting question. The reality is there's no official answer to that because if you're trying to sell a dozen houses as one job lot, a parcel together, you're primarily talking to some experienced, um, experienced property companies who specialize in buying that kind of stock. Um, if you're going to sell individually, which would be my advice, then the question becomes, first of all, if you have, I don't know, 20 properties and 20 different buyers, no problem. The question then becomes, are you going to raise more money by offering them in a London auction or a local auction? And who knows the answer to that? I'm a London auctioneer. I of, am of the belief that the buyers in London who are, prime, you know, I, I hate to say it, but there's a lot of the wealth is, is based in London. Sure. Um, and the reality is a lot of our clients have huge portfolios all around the country and would not have any issue purchasing three lots down here four lots over there and six lots over there. So especially if the seller is wishing to achieve sales that marry up together, they want to get rid of all these properties on the same day, well, then it, it, on the completion dates all marry up as well. Well, it's quite obvious you need to sell them all through the same uh, auctioneer and then you're going to go, you're going to go to London mm -hmm. um, because obviously that way um, you encompass all the, all the potential buyers. It's far, uh, it's far more likely that a London buyer would purchase 
up north than a northern buyer would purchase down in London. It's just the kind of the that's, way it works That's a good out. point. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Anything to add to that, John? In the world I've been in, I sort of did a lot of town centre apartments. And I remember when we were going to market, we'd always sell them individually. But on a few occasions, you'd have um, a bulk purchase, a fund, a, an individual that wanted to build a portfolio and would sort of almost say that it's too small to buy 20 units, 30 units, 50 units, whatever their number is. But every time I went to sell them in bulk, they always wanted a pretty significant discount. Exactly that. So I think if you are, you know, we, would, we would try and gauge the market, you know, just flipping that as from the developer's point of view. So actually, can we, is the market strong enough that Savills, Knight Frank, can sell the whole lot at the right number or do we take a number now that's less? Um, that's that's the sort of decision making I've, I've been in. Okay, lovely. Well, that's all we've got time for in this half of the show. So join me again after the break when we'll be asking John and Andrew more of your questions. Hello and welcome back to part two of Property Question Time with John Reynolds and Andrew Binstock. Welcome back, guys. Uh, John, your second question. Do the panel think that instead of the old 106 agreements where developers were forced to provide up to 30% social housing, it should be the government who should provide perhaps loans to councils to go back to the system of local authorities building council-owned homes? This would actually significantly reduce the cost of private new homes as a side effect. 100% I think, yes. I think that's right, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And I think going back to... Being a developer when Section 106 was brought in, you know, it felt like a stealth tax. And I'll, I'm not going to try and cause a load of controversy, but it felt like what it was spent on ultimately wasn't particularly useful to the community and all the things it was supposed to be achieving. Yeah. And it hasn't worked. Well, I, I consulted on, on, on one development, and I won't mention the councils because it wouldn't be fair, but, sure. but the, the, there was a half a million pound contribution agreed instead of what, whatever. And the council had got no use for that money. So as, as, the, as the council were going to re, re, sort of receive this on the completion of the development in a couple of years' time, sure. they actually sold it in advance to another local authority for a discounted you amount. You can't pay, tell me things like this. Immediately. I mean, it's That's such shocking. a wind-up. It's such shocking. Wind -up. I mean, the pointless fountains and stuff yeah. that have that long since, because no one then maintains them. So they no. do these things, they think it'd be great, and then no one's interested, and then they don't kind of have to stand the sort of longevity. I think the thing that ultimately brought Section 106 in was that uh, living off almost that kind of benchmark half and half, all of it became third and third, third for the land, third for development costs, mm. and third profit. Developers you know, were doing pretty well at the time, and there was, there was potentially profit to be had. That's changed, you know. Going back to, to the previous part of this program, you know, costs have gone through the floor. The the kind of margin that the developer is making, if any, is very small. So actually, relying on the private developer to contribute isn't going to solve social but, housing but, at all. But John, you know, the the favourite thing is to say, well, developers have got loads of money; they can afford these sort of sort of stealth taxes, as you as you term them, but. You know, what, do, what do the public think the developer's doing? All as he says, well, okay, if I've got to spend two million quid on, on um, sort of a, a, a tax, if you like, a 106 agreement, all I'm going to do is I'm building 50 flats, so I'm going to divide that two million quid by 50, put it on the price of the flats, and no wonder young people can't afford a home. Yeah. You know, no, I, I totally I mean, get it. I mean, it's self-defeating, isn't it, yeah. in a way? And I think when times are good, you know, when interest rates have, are not as, as they are now, when you have you lived through COVID and some of these major seismic shifts, you know, a developer's then fully exposed and taking a lot of risk. I think a lot of developers previously have done incredibly well, which doesn't always help the, the perception uh, mm -hmm. and the image, if you like. But they are taking risks and they're providing a valuable you know, resource needed in this country of, I, of housing. I, I, tell you, I mean, you, you know, I've been in and around property development. Well, it seems like 100 years now. But, uh, do you know, I, the risks, I, I just can't think why anybody would want to go into property development. I no. totally agree with that. <laughs> <You know>? well, <laughs> no, it's scary. It's scary. And, and yet, you know, the reasons to do it are well founded. It's an incredibly rewarding thing to be part of, and you are providing homes for people and so on. But you know that the moment you set out, you're, you're terrified of what the next news headlines might be, whether that's external events that can affect, you know, I was doing town centre apartments. Think about how that savaged yeah. uh, with, with COVID. You couldn't have predicted it. 
um, all sorts of things that you're up against, let alone the supply chain issues that affect costs. So you're trying to, to make a business out of it. How much will this cost? How much will that cost? And then it completely changes. Well, I was talking to a developer the other day who was saying that the costs rise in between him getting a quote from suppliers to actually placing the order, yeah. you know, which is yeah. days or possibly just weeks. Totally. And that, can, that at, at certain times, going back to not that long ago, I can remember a steel quote which was, was kind of given to you on like a Monday and you had to agree it within three or four days because they didn't know where they were going to be at. You know, and that's just one example. It's oh, hard. I'm quite sure, Andrew, you, this is a world you're glad to be away from, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> Just take the product and sell it. You got it. And new build flats, people come to us all the time asking, you know, what's my new... Selling new build is, is the hardest thing to do at auction. For obvious reasons, all the value's already been added. It's already there. There's no scope for the person who buys it to sort of, unless it's at a, at a really good rental investment sort of price. But I do always wonder from a snobby point of view, you know, if you're... If you're the person that's buying the flat that's right next door to all the flats that have gone to this, you know, do you want to live in that one so much or the ones for, I don't know. And uh, I've always wondered, uh, and I'm glad I'm not on that side of the fence. If I, I'm happy to sell the development sites to you and let you worry about all that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so people think it's a wonderful world of development, but I mean, yeah, you, you can buy a new build, right? And it's probably the first half a dozen that gets sold. So, because the developer's not quite sure where he is in the market. Um, and then the developer ends up sometimes having to discount the last half a dozen because all his profits have been less in that la last yeah. half a dozen, which are probably not the best ones of the... Of no, I get it. But then, to, but, then, but then I've been on the flip side of that. You know, when the market's good, you can actually sell the first half to prove concept, to, to benchmark the pound per square foot and the, the kind of saleability. And then the market's going with you. And you wish you hadn't sold those ones yeah. for the, so you sell them. I've been on that side of the thing. So being a developer, it does have its its ways. Well, I was taught it's, it, the, the first apartment you sell is always the hardest one because once you've started, you yeah. can't stop, can you? No, absolutely. <laughs> that's, that's that's good place to be. Yeah, good. <laughs> okay, great. All right, um, Andrew. I'm considering using an auction house to sell a number of my properties, and wonder if, like agents' fees, the auctioneers' fees are negotiable. I'd also like to know if the buyer too pays the auctioneers a fee on their property purchases. I guess I'm simply trying to get a cost comparison against agency fees. Um, so the costs of an auctioneer are completely negotiable, um, rather like an estate agent, depending on the value of the property and depending on the saleability, um, a good auctioneer will always be entering into a conversation about that. You know, a one million pound building versus a 100,000 pound building, you're gonna be more flexible. Um, in terms of, and this is a little trick that a lot of the, our sellers don't know, in terms of how to offset some of your um, commission costs onto a buyer, it can be done. And it's done through the special conditions of sale, which is the contract between the seller and the buyer. And the seller can um, state in their contract with the buyer, um, upon completion, I would like you to reimburse me for 1% plus VAT or whatever it might be towards a contribution towards my selling costs. And so there is definitely a way for the sellers to offset some of those costs. Um, but in terms of, is it more expensive to sell by a state agent or by auction? Um, it's certainly not more expensive by auction. Um, quite the opposite. I would imagine most of the time it would be cheaper. Really? Okay. Um, Andrew, perhaps you can help me with this. We, we get a lot of questions in and it, it's, a, it's a regular thing that we're asked. The, the, the sort of general perception is by the uninitiated, if you like, is that if a property or in fact any product is in auction, there's something wrong with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's a reason why it's in the auction. Why, why hasn't it been sold by conventional means through an agent or through a you know, retail yeah. outfit? What, what do you say about that? So 25 years ago when I first started out and I was training, um, I was always taught, just remember this, every phone call you ever get, you're the person of last resort. You're the, you're, you're the end of their chain. They've tried everything and now they come to you. Okay. I'd like to think that the modern era has completely changed that now. Um, obviously, we have the internet. Um, all of us auctioneers, any good auctioneer rather, will be using the same methods of sale as an estate agent through the portals that I won't name. So quite honestly now, this concept that it's an underground club of dealers and developers and people who only know the secrets of it all um, is all gone now. Anyone can buy at auction, anyone can sell at auction. 
Um, and quite honestly, um, it's so open to all. And there's obviously TV shows like yours, which help educate. Um, I honestly believe now that an, an auction is open to absolutely everybody. Mm. Um, and we, the amount of buyers we have who said, I've never ever bought an auction before. What a lovely journey that was. Nice and quick, very transparent. Everything was clear for me. It was immediate. The minute no one's faffing around. There's no gazumping or gazundering, people changing their minds, suddenly waking up the next day and going, oh, I've had a better offer. None of that. The beauty of that fall of the gavel, determining an immediate sale works for both seller and buyer in exactly the same way and benefits both equally. Yeah, but you, you, you're actually quite sort of special in the market, aren't you? Because what you've created is a, an auction system that works nationwide, s simply digitally, really. Uh, yeah, so again... So, so location doesn't matter. No. Your, your, your spread is nationwide. Really wide. And yeah, they're very smart. I so think, yeah. once upon a time, an auction was a ballroom. You would go into the room and you'd have to be there present if you wanted to be part of it. Um, and that, that meant the buyer, the buyers, wouldn't have to get out of bed, drive into London, da 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 Now it's all changed. So obviously with the onset of COVID, we switched to a, a live stream auction and a lot of our, our competitors did exactly the same thing. This now opened up an entire new market for buyers. So you can now flip open your laptop, do a bit of bidding, close your laptop, carry on with your day. This whole concept of it's so elitism, you've got to go all the way and do this. It's a whole day out of my, you know, especially if you have another job, you're a doctor, accountant, you don't want to take a whole day out. All that has changed now. So I would say that auctions are so accessible to buyers, it has brought in an entire new wave of sellers. Have you but got you know, stats that show how many people are now buying in the room and out? That well, I can tell you, so I've got a great stat, in, not stats as such, but I've got this, uh, I can see my own growth of how many people now register to bid at auctions versus how many people would turn up to an auction room in the old days. In the old days, three or 400 people turned up, you've had a good day, their bums on the seats, you were happy to see all those faces. Now, if we have less than 2,000 individuals registering to bid, we'd call that quite low. It's incredible. These are people who are doing a lot of work as well. They've got to upload ID checks and do all their, mm. their anti-money laundering and they've got to swipe cards and things. So these aren't just whimsical. You know, it's a shame we've lost the theatre of it. But the, the, uh, other, the yeah. other thing is there, actually, it does add a lot of credence to, to, to the expression when people say that an auction really will find the true value of a property Correct. because you've got such a wide audience now. But, well, but a wide contribution from both sellers and buyers. On that exact point, Stephen, I've got to say, we have a lot of lots come to us from corporate clients where they've carried out um, official valuations. So we now have something to work off, whether it's a probate valuation, whatever it might be. The amount of times that our auction levels surpass those high-end valuations through the sheer uh, excitement of competitive bidding is, is incredible. When, you've, when you're a buyer and you've taken that day off, the, uh, day off work, or whatever it might be, or you're mentally engaged in it, you're, you're so invested, mm. your maximum was 300. Before you know it, you're at 320. You know, these sorts of things happen through the, th th through the, <laughs> the buzz of the auction. Yeah. Let alone a bidding war. I love bidding wars. That's, that's, that's exactly why so many of our sellers say, I wish I knew about auctions before I even tried the, the open market because I didn't really, you know what it's like when you're selling one of your developments through an estate agent and you've got it on at 399950 and they come straight in and say, I've got you 3 you're like, marvellous, aren't you clever? What you didn't know was that four other people would have paid you 410, 420, four, you know what I mean? And that's, that's where auction comes in. Okay, well, there we are. That's all we've got time for today. So big thank you to John Reynolds. Thank you, John. And to you, Andrew, thank you. Thank you. Hope you've enjoyed your first uh, I loved it. outing it's great. with us. Good. Okay. <laughs> thank you. I'm Stephen Galpin. Join me again next time on Property Question Time.